Okay, here we go. This is the last portion of the analysis, the energy analysis of the cyclohexane conformer. So in the previous video, I showed you how to calculate the energies that we have here, the 12.7 and the 13.4, based on the Newman projections and the gauge interactions of the ethyl and methyl groups as they you know, relate to the rest of the cyclohexane molecule. But where I left you off was on this topic of the 1,3 diaxial interactions. Uh, what happens here is that the axial bonds are technically right next to each other and they are lined up per, you know, parallel to each other. So they, there is a steric interaction associated with these groups. Hydrogen on hydrogen, once again, is our baseline. So we don't include it in this analysis. So all we're really going to be concerned about is our group next to hydrogen uh, and potentially for you know one R group next to another R group we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit but what we have right here is methyl next to one of the hydrogens in the axial position and then we have also that same methyl next to the opposite hydrogen in an axial position and the same picture is shown right here they have a methyl group next to two axial hydrogens if you were to count the carbon that bears the axial R group as carbon one, then technically speaking, the axial hydrogens are exactly two carbons away or on carbons three. So this is why this is called the one comma three diaxial interaction. You're basically two bonds or two carbons away from each other in the main cyclohexane ring when it comes down to these axial interactions. So Ultimately, to get the entire energy profile of the conformers, what you have to do is add the energy of the gauge interactions with the energy of the diaxial steric interactions. And the values for such interactions are given in the following tables. Uh, now, what I want to point out to you so that you don't accidentally make a mistake in the future is that the values that you see in these tables are already the values for two you know, E group hydrogen interactions. So two of those interactions is already worth the value that you see in the table. So if the E group was methyl, two methyl hydrogen diaxial interactions is worth 7.1. So if you only wanted to know how much a single methyl hydrogen interaction is, you will have to divide the value by two. So this is kind of a comprehensive list of all the different groups that you might encounter. You know, you have your simple alkyl groups, but you have a few other ones. You have a vinyl group, you have uh, your alkyne group, your nitrile group, you have carboxylic acids, carboxylates, esters, etc., etc. So what we're going to do is we're going to add those groups. And in the tables, uh, let's go back to it, the... Diaxial, the 1,3 diaxial interaction is 7.5. The methyl 1,3 diaxial interaction is 7.1. So we add those two values correspondingly to the conformers, and this gives us the final value 19.8 kilojoules per mole for the conformer on the left side, and 20.9 kilojoules per mole for the conformer on the right side. Now, uh, this of course does not apply to the conformers we're looking at right now, but if you did have a conformer where you have a different R group, or it doesn't even have to be a different R group, this could be a, another methyl. The point is that this is not a hydrogen. So if this thing here is not a hydrogen and it's some other alkyl group or aromatic group, then you have to basically consider three interactions. The interaction of this methyl group with the R prime group, the interaction of the methyl group with the hydrogen, and the interaction of the R prime group with the hydrogen. Same thing here. You will have to account for the interaction of the ethyl group with the R prime, the interaction of the ethyl with the hydrogen, and the interaction of the R group with the hydrogen. And to make the analysis a lot simpler, what I'm going to ask you to do as an oversimplification is to treat the R prime interaction to whether it's ethyl or methyl or whatever this is, right? So this is the R group. Um, the R group to R prime interaction, treat that as being 8.4 kilojoules per mole if you have it. And then um, and then at that point, you know, you of course still have to treat the R prime to hydrogen interaction for whatever it is based on the table that I showed you before. But this will be the more complete 
way of looking at this. Uh, here you actually have to look at only one hydrogen diaxial interaction. So you will have to have the values for the R group to H interaction, the R prime to H interaction, those are the ones that are halved, and then the interaction between the R prime to R group, which is the 8.4. And that's just a very rough approximation. So this will be in you know the case in molecules that probably have more than two substituents on the cyclohexane. All right, but in our picture here, you know, there's only just yes, the methyl uh, hydrogen diaxial interactions or ethyl hydrogen diaxial interactions, which leads to the 19.8 and 20.9 kilojoules per mole difference. Once again, right conformer is less stable than the left conformer because it's at a higher energy. And the quick way of telling that just by inspection is that the ethyl group, which is bigger than the methyl group, is axial in this. Uh, conformer, uh, the methyl group is equatorial, whereas here the methyl group is actual and the ethyl group is equatorial. So um, one way of looking at it is by seeing what's on the actual position. The other one is by looking at what is the biggest group between methyl and ethyl. Ethyl is the bigger group. In this conformer, ethyl is equatorial. In this conformer, ethyl is axial. And if the bigger group is axial, that's always going to be by, uh, bad news in terms of energy for the molecule. All right, so there is one more thing I want to show you, and that's the fact that because we do have energies, you can treat them as being the Gibbs free energies of the associated conformer. And with that in mind, we can actually calculate the equilibrium constant associated with the transformation from one conformer to the other, and ultimately determine the amounts percentage wise that we're going to have of each conformer in solution. So what I'm doing right here is I'm simply subtracting the values. Now, I'm kind of doing it randomly. Probably it'd be best if you subtract the final, so the, the right conformer value with the left conformer, but right here I'm just doing 19.8 minus 20.9 um, to get the difference in Gibbs free energy. Now, if I do that, that's going to yield negative 1.1 for the delta G. The value of R is 8.3145. Uh, temperature treated just as room temperature in Kelvin, so 298. And what we do is we simply carry out the um, conversion right here, right? So uh, the other thing too is that this is in kilojoules per mole, whereas the R constant is in joules per mole. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change that delta G from 1.1 kilojoules to 1100 joules. Uh, this is something that needs to happen, otherwise your units don't cancel out, even though I'm not showing you the units right here. All right, so now we actually get to divide uh, the negative 1100 by negative 8.3145 times 298, and that yields the 0 0.444. 0 0.444 equals the ln of k. So if you take the anti-log, you're going to end up with e to the 0.444 being equal to k. And that itself is equal to 1.56. All right, so this is what happens. 1.56 being the equilibrium uh, constant for this process is going to be equal to amount of product over amount of reactant, right? And this is kind of what I was saying here. If you want to be consistent with how you draw your equation, technically you, be, you should be subtracting the product amount with the reactant amount. So this should have been 20.9 minus 19.8 to keep it consistent and so that you, you don't confuse yourself. Uh, but in any case, we're going to solve for x ultimately and whatever the value ends up being, if it is greater than 50%, we're going to associate that value with the conformer that has the lower energy. Okay, so this is the way it goes. Uh, regardless of which conformer you have, it is still the same molecule. So you could say, well, if you start with 100% of cis, one ethyl, two methyl cyclohexane, whatever X amount you have percentage wise, Y is going to have to be basically 100 minus X, right? Because together they both add up to 100%. So Y has to be 100 minus X. And so what you do is you cross multiply 100 minus x to both sides. You multiply 1.56 by 100, you get 156%. You multiply 1.56 by minus x, you get minus 1.56 uh, times x. 
And if you add 1.56 times x to both sides, you're going to end up with 2.56x on the right side. Divide both sides by 2.56 and you'll find out that x is 61. And since 61% is greater than 50%, you are going to associate this value with the conformer that has the least energy. So that's the most stable conformer. And then, of course, the other one will be 100 minus x, which in this case is 39%. Right? So that will be associated with a conformer in which the ethyl group is axial. All right, so this is the whole analysis. So now if I've shown you how you can look, starting with your conformers, you can ultimately find out and approximate how much you expect to see of each one of the two molecules in solution. And this will be perhaps the most convoluted calculation that you're ever going to do in this class. Um, and it's one of the very few ones that you actually do a calculation for. Um, but do make sure to practice this type of process. It's not very difficult, but it does entail that you get every single part right. Because if you make a mistake anywhere on the lines, then yes, this is going to go downhill easily. Um, but with that being said, uh, that's pretty much the end of the lecture. So in the next lecture series, we'll start talking about stereoisomerism. So I will see you then. Bye-bye.